Jensenville Edwards received her doctorate from the Institute of Fine Arts in NYU in 2014. And since July 2019, she has been the chief curator and curator of contemporary art here at the Mint Museum. Prior to the Mint, Dr. Sidul Edwards held curatorial positions at the Norton Simon Museum, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, the Beckler Museum of Modern Art right uptown, and the Annenberg Space for Photography in Los Angeles. She has received many awards, but her two favorites are an SEMC Gold Award for her Wrestling the Angel exhibition publication in 2018, and a Charlatine of the Year Award from Charlotte Magazine in 2019. And I just have to say that I think she, there is not a greater champion for artists in Charlotte than Jen Edwards. That is, she, she walks that walk, she lives it every day, and you're going to hear more about that. And be sure to tune into the Charlotte's Creative Podcast uh, on the Queen City Podcast Network because we're going to be having a conversation with Jen uh, after this event, and you can learn more uh, about her and from her. So, Daybreak Legends here to speak to us on our global theme of Rise. Please welcome our very first speaker of 2024, Jen Edwards. Come on up, Jen. With the idea of rise also comes the idea of fear and vulnerability. Um, and that's going to come up in my little talk to you all this morning as well. Um, is, what am I? Am I here? Am I here? Okay. Oh, sad. <laughs> okay. Um, but to start, I'm going to ask you all, I mean, we just had this great, it's not going to be as great as criticism, actually, like, <laughs> feel a little, a little weighted down here. Um, but I'm going to ask you all to do a trust exercise with me. So I'm going to do it too. Um, I want us all to close our eyes and we're going to listen to something together. You ready? Okay, here we go. Okay. Yeah, my Angelou. Um, so when Tim told me that the theme of today's talk was going to be rise, the first thing that came into my head was that poem by Maya Angelou, And Still I Rise. Um, so I was 15 when I first saw Angelou perform that poem at the Count Basie Theater in Red Bank, New Jersey. And for the last 40 years, that song has carried in my body. And it's been my buoy, one of many, that I seek to grab onto when I need some sort of lift. 
So of course I wanted to start the day with that. How could I give you anything that would even compare to Angelou's elevation with that poem? So I'm not saying it's all downhill from here, I promise, <laughs> I promise. We're gonna stay at Angelou's elevated rate for the rest of this talk. Um, but I wanted to start with that trust fall of closing our eyes and listening because that's what my work, being with a work of art, is all about, these trust falls. So every day I close my eyes, literally or figuratively, and experience a work of art, waiting for it to, to raise me up. And that can be three minutes in front of a painting. It can be five minutes in a song. It can be two hours in a movie. And it can be the shittiest Marvel action film. Or it can be a modern masterpiece like Midsummer Masterpiece, masterpiece. Um, but I'm always there to give over to the work and then actually let that lift me and take me on a journey. And as a museum curator, my job is to create those moments of trust falls and lifts for audiences. So, it can either be with the artworks themselves or in the last five years, I've really been focusing on working directly with artists and helping them to create new context or explore new ambitions. But really what I've been looking at is how to take all of that confidence and all of that um, belief that I have in what they can do and impart it to them to give them the courage to take those risks. So I actually wanted to be one of these magicians. I had hoped to be a dancer. I mean, I had a lot of hopes I was going to be a piano player, but we don't need to go there. So um, from the age of 12, I danced 40 hours a week. I commuted to and from my home in New Jersey into New York City, and I danced at uh, Joffrey Ballet School. Um, and I loved it. It was such a way to live. Um, and it also, gave me an opportunity to live amongst other artists. New York City, particularly Greenwich Village where Joffrey was, was just this hotbed of activity everywhere. It was all over the street. So you would find David Hammond in Cooper, uh, in front of Cooper Union in Astor Place selling his snowballs. And it didn't even seem strange to me. I mean, at 13, I was just like, yeah, I mean, sure, why not? next to this $2 coat that clearly some cat's been pissing on for like 10 years. Like, yeah, we'll buy a snowball for a dollar. Um, and of course, like at 13, I didn't get the capitalist critique. I didn't get the commentary about the art market and racism and everything else. I just saw this as a viable creative practice. Just like when I would walk around and look in these little cracks of all the deteriorating buildings, New York City was falling apart in the 70s and 80s you would find Charles Simmons' little Pueblo villages that he built in these little cracks of the city. It was magical. Or you'd be walking along the street and see Christy Ruff's drawings that you would paste up of rats above piles of trash where real rats would be coming out because we had a trash crisis for many years. Or Richard Hambleton's incredibly spooky shadow men who would be on walls around corners or at the mouths of alleyways. And so many days, mornings, nights, when I was leaving class, I would come upon these and really think that this was the moment. <laughs> but then there were also all of these really in-your-face women who taught me about how to own my own power and how to be a feminist and to understand how to hold my place in the public sphere. So Hannah Wilkie, who you see here, was an artist who um, would literally make these pieces and put them up around the streets. Um, and like Hammond, she would use humor. I mean, you see here, she created little vulvas out of chewing gum and she'd paste them all over her body. And then she'd put them up around on the streets of Soho. And then sometimes you would like find a little thing of chewing gum and you'd be like, is that somebody's just wad of chewing gum or is that a Wilkie vulva? And it would just be like this great moment in my morning at 13 and my mom would be horrified. Um, and of course the Gorilla Girls who 
really brought me into the awareness of what my responsibility was going to be as I went into the world as an artist or as anything I chose to be. If I wanted to have my voice heard, it was going to be a fight. Um, so this is my world from 12 to 16. And then I had the aha moment. I was auditioning for companies because I wasn't going to go to college. I was going to be a dancer in a company. And I'd risen not to the top of my class at Joffrey, but I was doing okay. I was doing pretty well. And I was at an audition for the Ballet Wichita. 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 <laughs> Nothing against Wichita. It's just like, that's, that's not New York City Ballet. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway, so I was at this audition. There were 50 of us in the room, and we were one of like 10 groups in the day. So there were like 500 dancers they were going to see. And I looked around the room and I was like, oh my God, I'm the worst dancer here. Like I'm not even kind of the worst. Like I'm the worst, the worst. And at that moment I was like, okay, this, this is not going to be it for me. Like I don't think I'm even going to get a job in a court of ballet in like a fourth level ballet company. I think I better think about college. And I think I better think about what I'm going to do at college. And I realized my path to fame and fortune was going to be poetry. <laughs> that was it. Because all those years on all those hours on the bus, I'd been listening to my Walkman and I'd been copying down lyrics to the songs and I was reading poetry and reading literature and I was writing my own poetry and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is going to totally work out. So I went to NYU, started as a film major, whole other story, realized that was not going to be the place for me either. Todd Phillips, love his films, but very specific masculine kind of genre. He was the top of my class when I entered. So that was not the environment for me, despite Gorilla Girls' encouragement. I wasn't quite ready to wear that mask yet and be naked. So I really focused on the poetry and the performance poets who led me on that journey. So Karen Finley, who made us think about how language and bodies and politics defined what was taboo, but also what we could do in public and why we had those beliefs. Not that we had them, but why. And then Coco Fusco, oh my gosh, she was my idol. I loved her so much. And she was someone who would just appear somewhere. I was at a BAM. Uh, performance and she was just in the lobby dressed as Queen Isabella see her here and it was just before the 500 year anniversary of um, you know Columbus discovering America and she was handing out deeds to land <laughs> to anyone who came up to her table and that whole idea of like the ridiculousness the absurdity the just brazenness of giving away land because you wear a crown and that made me think, okay, yeah, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this for a while. And so from about 1990 to uh, 1999, I was a performance poet, doing my thing. Um, and then I had another aha moment. I was at a party at my then acquaintance, now husband's house, uh, apartment in Brooklyn. And uh, Gavin Edwards, my husband, um, was a music editor at Details Magazine. And so his parties were known for attracting the, a certain level of publishers and literary people and editors. And so if you wanted to get your work read and seen and out there, you would go to these parties and you would network and you would hobnob. So it, it also attracted this wonderful crew of comic artists because Gavin collects comic art. And so that's why I was there, because I love those guys. I loved hanging out with all those comic artists. And I'd be in the corner talking to them, hearing about what they were doing. And then one party, I watched a friend of ours who is the most social, was, I haven't talked to her in 10 years, but was the most socially maladroit person I had ever met in my life. Same age as me, methodically walk around the room, talk to every single important person, talk about her work, didn't even really ask about them, but talked about her work, pitched herself. And within a couple of months, she had her first book deal for six figures at like 28. And that's when I was like, oh yeah, no, this isn't my, this isn't my path either. 
This is like it's not even fame and fortune. Like I'm not I'm not ever gonna quit my job as a grants writer to be able to pay my rent with the nothing I'm making off my poetry. So yeah, time time to rethink that too. And so I went back to grad school and became and a museum curator, because I realized that is what I could do. I could talk about other people's work. I could talk about um, and imbue belief into them to push their practice. That I was comfortable doing. And museum work, unusually, would also give me the opportunity to not only use this writing, which I still believe in, damn it, but it would also give me an opportunity to explore all of those issues that I saw as incredibly important and urging and pressing and things that I didn't see us talking enough about in person. I could bring that into the galleries using other people's artwork to have those discussions. So I could do something like Wrestling the Angel and talk about how spiritual practice could be really challenging for one to develop if you were always distracted by the fact that the history of religion, whether it's paganism or it's Protestantism, is a political practice. It's nothing to do with the people. It's a political practice of power. You have to weed through that to get to the spirituality and humanity. But the fundamental structure started and was perpetuated by politics. So, so where, is the, where is the spiritual in that? I could also look at the history, the history, because through all humanity, people have built walls, built barriers, thinking it was gonna defend them, it was gonna keep things out, it was gonna protect the people behind it, or they were gonna be able to project some divine presence onto it. This is a human story, not one that started in 2016 during an election, or in 1961 with the Berlin Wall. So I was able to do an exhibition looking at that, but I was also for the first time able to work with contemporary artists, in this case, Candy Chang and James Reeves, to do a major public work. So they built three of these um, light boxes, it's called Lighting the Barricade, and it was installed all around Los Angeles. You see it here, the resentment barrier in front of City Hall. And so, it was great that Matt had that line earlier, how roadblocks become opportunities, because that in fact was what Chang and Reeves were trying to teach us, that with these feelings that we'd have that create invisible barriers within ourselves from each other, if you could meditate on that, there was a meditation space on the back of these walls, you could probably figure out how to absorb what seemed like opposition or seemed like a defense or a deterrent or a delineation, and you would be able to use it in your life instead of being hemmed in by it or blocked by it. So that created another pivot for me. And I started thinking about how to work specifically with contemporary artists to blow their practice out, how to figure out what the most ambitious things that they could do could be realized and to help them think of even bigger things and realize that. I wanted to come always from a place of yes, because I wanted those people to know that they were empowered to take that risk and that the vulnerability would be protected in some way. And I would do that if I could, even during a pandemic when people seemed to need it the most. So when Carla Aaron Lopez came to me during the pandemic, is she here? <laughs> oh my God. Hi. What happened? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought something didn't work. Okay, hi Carla. Um, so when Carla Aaron Lopez came to me um, in, during the pandemic, it was like the summer of 2020 or fall of 2020, um, and said, hey, I want to install an art show in the Mint Galleries. I was like, yes, let's figure this out. We can do this. Yes. And so the first iteration was held here at Mint Randolph in 2021. Um, we had wished it could have been longer, but Carla wanted three days. Carla wanted 24 hours, and we negotiated to three days. Um, oh, shoot, sorry. And it was followed by two other 
successful iterations, both at Uptown. But what that did was it solidified a program that the Mint had already kind of been doing um, for the last couple of years. And that was giving over the fifth floor space of Uptown to outside curators, to people who didn't really have a curatorial practice or training, um, and let them experiment in the space. And so what Jamila Brown and I, Jamila, raise your hand, um, the curatorial assistant in my department, what she and I do is open up this space for people and help them learn how to have that curatorial practice so that they too can learn how to use objects and present these stories to become storytellers, but also to help other people understand what cultural literacy and visual language means to us in today's world. Um, Jamil and I are also trying to do that with other performance forms. So we've been doing the Wednesday Night Live series for the last four years at Mint Uptown. And again, this is to show how it's not just visual arts, every single art form has that opportunity, whether it's fashion or a kiki ball or a dance performance or a poetry performance. And it also plays into my obsession with all of these art forms I failed at over the course of my 54 years. So I did also do some fashion design and took classes at FIT. That's a whole other story that we don't need to talk about. But, and I did see you, damn it. But the most elevated moment for me is when an artist who is entering the public space is completely vulnerable. Now, usually this is when the work is the most challenging, controversial, and while a lot of people see it as bravado or um, a way to push these works and conversations into the public sphere, I see that as a confidence that's necessary because they know they're gonna get that public pushback. They're opening themselves up to an incredible amount of criticism and risk when they put those creations on display. And that's true for anyone, right? But when it's something really, really provocative, that's an equal risk to the creator as it is to the viewer. So damn it, Wesley's mural that was done in response to the Mince Picasso landscape absolutely can be read as exploitative or voyeuristic or sexist or it can be seen as maybe a call to recognize the fact that there are many white artists who are shown in museums and could be called the same thing, often are called the same thing, and yet it's okay. Aerosol Gonzalez, <laughs> um, who was part of the intervention series here. Please go upstairs and see Jackie Millard's version uh, in the Mesoamerican galleries. Um, Jackie, uh, I'm sorry, Irisol really took risks with this one. So Irisol wanted to explore the damaging effects of machismo in Latinx culture. Um, and she made these paintings for the Mesoamerican galleries, but she's not only talking about Latinx histories, like the history of the quinceanera, which is attached to the history of child brides in that culture, and also to the celebration and preciousness of women's pain, of enduring great suffering as a show of their strength. So this was not only a risk Irisol took with the general public, the Latinx public, who maybe didn't necessarily agree with her positions or that she was speaking for the culture, but very directly it put her at risk with her family, who were pretty upset to see those paintings about the quinceanera because it was in fact her cousin who was represented in those paintings and the 54-year-old man she was married off to when she was 15. And I know, oh my God, I could just cry. Um, but she did it. She did it. So I spoke about trust falls at the beginning. And I know that's a hard ask right now, right? Like it's a decisive, depressing time. We are still discovering the effects of COVID and the pandemic, a time when we were asked to isolate away from everyone, but also we had to put our trust in other people, right? Like our neighbors, our coworkers, our family, sure, but then also strangers 
to keep us safe. And also our government, the medical and pharmaceutical industry. When have I ever trusted them to do anything for me that was in my best interest? And yet we had to do it. We needed to do it. And the result is we emerged more paranoid, more suspicious than before. Humanity's social fabrics that need to knit together even more tightly instead got more afraid. But this happens all the time, right? That's human history. Um, unfortunately, is not a story of minimum murder and mayhem. I wrote that down from the earlier. <laughs> um, so think of 1945, right? When at the end of World War II, the world that won was asked to forgive the Germans for the horrendous atrocities, the murder, the genocide that they brought on a number of people based on religion, race, and creed. But think also of what the United States asked of Japan to forgive us for completely annihilating two of their cities with nuclear bombs. Every culture, every people has this moment in history, many moments in history, when they need to ask for that moment of forgiveness. David, sorry for the blurry David Bowie, but David Bowie in the mid 70s took on the persona of the Thin White Duke. And this was probably his most controversial persona. I mean, Ziggy Stardust was out fun and lipstick and glitter and stuff. This was David Bowie taking on the persona of a German during the Nazi regime pre end of the war. And I know some of you are going to argue with me about this, but I'm happy to spend hours talking about this and deconstructing the Bowie lyrics. Gavin, that means you too, wherever my husband is. Um, <laughs> because we had a fight about this last night. So, um, <laughs> but Bowie went out there and he got a lot of pushback for it and a lot of criticism. And he ended up dropping the persona and moving to Berlin because he was putting on that skin of the most reviled, abhorrent person in our minds at that time, in the second half of the 20th century, because he was going to see where the humanity was in there. He needed to understand because we are all still human in the end. That was his project. And the song lyrics, I think, beautifully, beautifully capture that. We're one in a million. All of us are one in a million, 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 million. It's not that we're unique. It's that we're all in this together. And it's only that connection through love that's going to sustain us when the cannons come. So to take a risk, even if it's just exploring or supporting someone like any of these artists who are taking a very public risk, is what I ask you to do as you leave here. I want you to be patient with them. You may hate it. You may disagree with their work, you may find it offensive, you may think it idiotic, but even that inflating blood pressure that you're feeling, that's a rise. That's lifting you to another plane. That's putting you in another position where you can see where we are, what we can be, and you can also take that offer and see what else could be waiting for us. So. I'm going to end and have the incredibly powerful magical strings of Anna Meredith's, oh no, this isn't your cue, Steve. Okay, <laughs> powerful strings of Anna Meredith's Nautilus lift you up out of your seats and carry you up to the Mint Museum galleries. Please see all of our art. And thank you so much for all of this today.